the chat. <laughs> you can go ahead and pop where you are looking in from tonight. So what city you're in, in that chat, so we can see where everybody's coming in from. There we go. Bellingham, Redmond, I see you. Issaquah, Tacoma. <laughs> Nice, Cheney. There you go. San Diego. <laughs> awesome. If you're just logging in here, folks, go ahead and put in the chat where you are dialing in from tonight. So what city you're in. All righty, and since this is being recorded tonight, we're going to go ahead and get started. So we're hosting this Backcountry 101 as part of our Mountain Safety Fest at Crystal Mountain. Uh, we're all about making sure everyone's safe at this mountain playground. So Mountain Safety Fest focuses on gamifying every aspect of mountain safety. So everything from getting up here safely with your vehicle, what to do for prepping for that mountain trip, to knowing where ski patrol is located, knowing where to fuel up, all the different aspects of being safe on this mountain. Uh, we know that a lot of folks are getting into the backcountry these days, so we wanted to include this introduction to backcountry and we chose our uh, very fine guide partner alpine ascents international and robin is one of their very trusted guides so i'm going to kick it over to robin but first i wanted to also remind you all that we do have a giveaway uh, for every one of you that are participating tonight and are dialing in we're going to be giving away a spot on one of our backcountry seminars with alpine ascents international coming up here in march so stay tuned to the end of the presentation right before q a we'll draw that winner uh, but Robin, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Backcountry 101, an introduction to earning your turns. I'm here representing Alpine Ascents International. The guide service has partnered with Crystal to provide this education for the evening. A little bit about myself. I am currently a mountain guide for Alpine Ascents International, and I'm actually a previous ski patroller for Crystal Mountain, so you might have seen me out and about at Crystal. I am a professional observer for the Northwest Avalanche Center and an avalanche awareness instructor for them as well. And I'm also an avalanche instructor through Alpine Ascents International, so I teach those uh, area level ones, area level twos that you might have heard about in the past. All of which is to say, I spend a lot of time in the snow. Specifically, I spend a lot of time in the backcountry. It's definitely one of my favorite places to, um, my favorite ways to get out and enjoy the snow. And I'm really excited to share some of that stoke and knowledge with you all here tonight. The overarching arching goal tonight is that, you know, we're here because we love winter. We love getting out in the backcountry. This photo was actually taken just outside of Crystal in the Morse Creek drainage, a popular touring area. And I want to hear a little bit, you know, from you all about your goals for the evening. But in addition to just loving winter, we also have a goal of safety. That's the whole idea behind the Mountain Safety Fest is that we want to prioritize safety. We want everybody to be able to get out and enjoy the outdoors and to be able to make every trip a round trip, to come home at the end of the day. So in order to have successful adventures, you need to plan and prepare in a way that keeps yourself safe. So we'll talk tonight a lot about some tips and tricks that will ease your transition in the backcountry from getting the gear that you need to getting the training that you want to have. So that way you can go out and have a good time and come home at the end of your day. General agenda for this evening, kind of dividing this course into two sections. In part one, we're going to talk about some fundamentals, just the basics of like what is touring. Uh, we're going to talk about gear selection if you're choosing your first setup, and we're going to talk about some ideas for packing, the things that you might want to bring with you if you're traveling into the backcountry. In part two, we're gonna talk more about the training end of things. So we're gonna talk about avalanche education, first aid, uh, trip planning resources and ways to set up and build community. So that way you can connect with other people that wanna recreate in the backcountry with you. I'd like people to drop in the chat. Who here has been in the backcountry before? Do we have some people that have spent some time traveling in the backcountry? You can note that in the chat. You can use your little, you know, like raise the hand emoji or the like little party emoji, thumbs up. Awesome. So some of you. What about who wants to get in the backcountry this year? Maybe in the future, they're kind of waiting to get a little bit of experience, learn a little bit more. You can raise your hands. You can drop some something in the chat. Awesome. So why do we head into the backcountry? Why do you guys want to spend time in the backcountry? Feel free to enter in the chat, maybe brainstorm a couple things that you're really 
anticipating finding when you leave the ski resorts behind and you head out into the wilderness. Lots of good ideas. I see untouched snow, I see pow, peace. And I see a lot of notes about uh, just crowds. Yeah, getting out into areas where you can kind of enjoy a little bit more of a wilderness experience where you're not surrounded by, you know, 8,000 of your best friends on a busy ski resort day. And really those are, you know, similar things that I think of wanting when I think about why I head out to the backcountry. I think about the powder, I think about the exploration. I think about connecting with my friends. I think about fitness. I think about a longer ski season, right? You can tour in the backcountry much longer than you can ski at the resort because you can keep skiing in Washington pretty much up until June or July. There are even people that, you know, do the turns all year, ski every single month of the year. No more lift lines and summit views. So there's a lot of really good reasons to spend time in the backcountry and that makes a lot of sense why a growing number of people are spending time in the backcountry. Specifically with lift lines, right? We see a lot more people using ski resorts, which is awesome. We want everybody to have the opportunity to access what is a really fun activity, but on really busy days, um, it definitely is driving more and more people into the backcountry to look for ways to get away from the crowds and have more of that peaceful winter experience. Traveling in the backcountry does come with additional risks and responsibilities, right? You're further from help if you need help. You might be exposed to avalanche hazard or other hazards that are mitigated if you're traveling in the ski resort. So with that, you know, benefit of the POW and the friends and the no lift lines and the beautiful views, you have the risks and responsibilities of needing to know a little bit more, take more responsibility for the risks that you take and have a little bit more training. So let's get into some basics, some backcountry 101. When you're traveling in the backcountry, most people are gonna to want to travel on either AT skis or splitboards. When people are just getting into backcountry, you will see some people carrying their resort skis or resort board just on their back and then snowshoeing. This definitely works as a way to like get out and get some experience, but it is pretty cumbersome because you have to carry a lot of gear with you, it's heavy. So the ideal setup would be to have AT skis or a split board. These are specialized pieces of equipment that allow users to travel uphill and then transition at the top and travel downhill. So all of this gear, whether you're a split boarder or a skier will have a tour mode, which allows you to skin uphill, to move uphill using skins and a ride mode, which lets you transition to more of a resort setup. If you have a split board, the two pieces come back together. If you have skis, the bindings lock the heels down to the skis, so that way you can slide downhill. And there's a lot of gear involved in traveling in the backcountry. I think a lot of people feel pretty intimidated by the idea of choosing your first setup. If you just walk into a shop and like are looking around, you might see, you know, a hundred different pairs of skis and 10 different types of bindings. So it's worth taking a little bit of time and thinking about what you actually are looking for in the gear that you might be buying. So we're gonna start with skiers, but don't worry, we will get to split borders as well. Um, thinking about AT skis, I think it's useful to start off by thinking what type of ski tour you think that you're gonna be. And I kind of broke it up into three categories. Um, you know, people that are really focused on the uphill, they're not really prioritizing the downhill component. They just want to travel really fast and far. Maybe they're really into the idea of uphill ski racing or randonnée racing. Maybe they're really excited about ski mountaineering. So climbing, you know, Mount Rainier with their skis. Additionally, we have people who are downhill focused. So these are people who, you know, like they are fine with the uphill walking, but really they just want to get those untouched powder laps. That's the goal at the end of the day. And finally, we have the all arounder, somebody who's pretty equally excited about both. If you can kind of identify which type of tourer speaks more to your style, it'll help guide what type of ski you want, what type of binding you want, and what type of boot that you want. If you're focused on the uphill, you're going to look for things that are really lightweight. You might end up using a ski that's made out of a really lightweight material like a carbon fiber. You might end up looking for a really minimalist binding that maybe doesn't ski quite as well as your resort binding. And you might look for a boot that has a big range of motion so that way you can walk really comfortably but doesn't give you that same support that you're used to when you're skiing in a resort. On the other end of a spectrum, if you're focused on the downhill, you want to make sure that you get a setup that's actually going to be fun for the downhill. So if you go into a ski shop and you're talking to the tech about what 
gear you want, make sure you've kind of given some thought to how you plan to be using the gear, because it just bums me out when I see people riding gear and struggling with gear that really isn't the right gear for how they plan to recreate. Some important things to consider with buying backcountry skis in specific are both the width, the length, and um, a little bit less important, the material and shape. So the width for an all-rounder ski in the Pacific Northwest, I think about 100 millimeters underfoot for touring is pretty beneficial. You definitely can get away with a narrower width underfoot if you plan on skiing a lot in the springtime or on big mountains, if your goal is kind of that uphill focused. Um, if your goal is downhill focused, get a similar width to what you like skiing with in, in the resort. In terms of length, most people like to go a little bit shorter on their touring ski. It makes it easier to make some of those turns when you're heading uphill, and it makes your skis just a little bit easier to manage if you're skiing some weird snow or tight trees. And in terms of shape, do think about the um, the design of the ski. You know, I'll be totally honest. I'm 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 really not ultra in touch with all of the technology that goes into ski shape and material. But if you get a ski that's fully rockered, it can be hard to get the edge to engage into the slope if you're doing a bunch of skinning on uh, on the mountain. So it can be nice to have a little bit of a more of a camber, a little bit more of a traditional shape to your ski. But again, get something that you're actually going to enjoy the downhill ride on. Um, you can, you know, there's a bunch of skis that are made to be backcountry skis. You'll see them marketed as designed for touring. Maybe they're made out of ultra light material and those can be a good option, but you can also mount pretty much any ski that we'd, you would use in a ski resort with touring gear. Just know that it'll be a little bit heavier, right? So if you have a ski brand that you really like and you really like those skis, um, I would start from there and look at what they have in maybe a slightly lighter, slightly shorter setup. In terms of bindings and boots, for skiers in backcountry touring, there's two main types of bindings. You have frame bindings and you have tech bindings. Frame bindings are gonna look a lot more like the bindings that you're familiar with from the resort. So they're gonna have a toe piece and a heel piece. The whole unit is gonna be connected and um, there'll be a lever in the back that you can clamp or unclamp. If it's unclamped, the whole unit will pick up with your foot so you can walk. And then if it's clamped, the whole unit locks down to the ski so you can travel downhill. The pros of these are that they tend to ski pretty well. Um, they're gonna be, you know, really familiar to you. There's not a lot of, you know, complicated parts. The cons are that they are very heavy. Um, it's just, it's gonna be exhausting if you're trying to do a really, really big day in the mountains to travel with frame bindings. The other end of spectrum, we have tech bindings which is where there's a set of pins in the front that clamp into your touring specific boots. You do have to have touring specific boots to use tech bindings. Frame bindings, you can actually use resort boots. Um, not, I wouldn't really recommend that because your feet will be pretty uncomfortable, but you could click into them with resort boots that do not have tech um, capacity. Tech bindings are, they're getting better and better. For a while, they did not have the same releasability that uh, frame binding did. So they didn't, if you fell, you might stay in your ski longer than you wanted to. And there were some knee injuries associated with that. Um, additionally, they used to pre-release on people. So if you were a bigger rider or if you were um, spending more time on kind of really tricky lines in the back country, there could be some, some downsides to that. But the technology has gotten better and better and they're really lightweight. They are a lot more expensive. So it's worth thinking about how, you, again, how you plan to use this gear and what's going to be important to you. In terms of boots, like I mentioned, you can use resort boots in the back country if you have frame bindings. The difference between resort boots and touring boots, first and foremost, is that resort boots do not, they are locked in position where your foot is, or your ankle is angled forward. Touring boots have a lever on them, so that way you can stand up straight or lock your foot forward. And the ability for that boot to move between standing up straight and locked forward gives you um, the ability to walk more comfortably and feel like you're walking in like a, a mountaineering boot as opposed to walking in a ski boot all day long. Additionally, most of them have Vibram soles. So if you're walking, if you take your skis off and are climbing in steep snow or over a rocky ridgeline, you'll have better grip than you would if you're in resort. They tend to be much lighter. They tend to be a little bit roomier. Um, on average, 
a touring boot is just not going to be as performance driven as a resort boot. So if you're the type of skier that's been skiing like 130 flex, like ultra intense slings, I think you're going to find that uh, touring boots are going to feel really soft. And honestly, most of the time that's okay. We're not, we're not using our boots in quite the same way that we are in the ski resort. So having a comfortable fit is important. If you're going to spend time uh, really trying to hone your setup, spend the time on the boots, right? The boots are going to what are going to be what makes or breaks your day. So this could be something that's worth actually, you know, you could order skis online, you could order bindings online, but trying on boots at a shop is going to be something that makes a difference and talking to different people about what works for them, how their foot is shaped. So starting to think about like, do you, do you have a wide foot or a narrow foot? What types of other boots fit your feet well or don't? And being able to talk about that with a ski tech shop will help you find something that'll really work for you. Awesome, split boards. So full disclosure, I'm a skier, I'm not a split boarder. Um, so I can really only speak generally about split boards. This slide, particular slide, was designed to talk about a couple different split boards that are created by the brand Weston, which offers a bunch of really great products. Um, and just like with choosing skis, you want to think about how you plan to use the split board. So identify what type of riding you like to do, what type of terrain you like to do, and that will translate to information about what type of split board you're going to want. More and more brands are putting out split boards, so there are lots of different options. And speaking to some of my friends that are split boarders, they say that like 10 years ago, it really felt like you were riding on, like you could really tell that it was a board that had been cut in half and it didn't ride quite as well. But some people have been saying, telling me recently that the boards have improved enough that you actually don't notice it as much. It's a lot more like your um, resort board, your, your board that's not cut in half. Split board boots and bindings. So split board bindings, there's a bunch of different brands out there. They're all designed to basically be totally removed from the split board itself. So that way you can go uphill with the split board separated and your bindings facing forward on each respective ski. And then you can reassemble your split board at the top of the run when you're ready to go downhill and flip your bindings to face sideways like you would when you're normally boarding. Um, it, they do seem to fall apart. <laughs> when, I say, when I say that, I mean that there's a lot of moving parts on those bindings between the, the buckles and the way that you attach them to the board and the way you change direction. So getting familiar with the binding that you have and getting familiar with the screws and the screw heads that you might need to make little micro adjustments is really going to help you out because I think almost every trip that I've done with split borders, they've like somebody has lost a screw at some point. And so having other split borders, they're like, oh yeah, I carry one or two extra of those is really helpful. Additionally, a couple key uh, repair items like a tool that can fit your particular split board binding, some zip ties, a little bailing wire will help you out a lot in the long run. In terms of boots, there are kind of three types of boots that get used by split boarders. So there are resort boots. You can tour in just your resort boots. Um, there are split board specific boots that are designed to be a little bit more durable, a little bit stiffer and have that Vibram sole. Some of them have compatibility with crampons if you do some like ski mountaineering. And then finally, some people will actually use a uh, hard boot. So they will use a ski boot when they are split boarding. And I know this sounds really counterintuitive, and I think it takes some split borders a little while to get used to, but it does have some pretty big advantages in the sense that it, um, it really eases the mountaineering component of ski mountaineering. So if you spend some time getting into the backcountry and you're like, wow, I just, I, I love split boarding, but I really want to take my split board to the top of big mountains. Um, ski boots on your split board will help you use tools like crampons a lot more efficiently. Additionally, it'll help you split ski better, which is kind of a silly thing that a lot of split boarders end up, a tool that split boarders end up using to travel in, in really, you know, uphill, downhill terrain. Well, they'll actually stay in split mode and ski those two really wide skis when, when you're in kind of rolly terrain that it would be really difficult to main, maintain speed on in a split board. And the final part, the thing that actually lets us go uphill is the skins. So there's a bunch of different companies that make skins. We kind of highlighted Mocha in the slide, but Black Diamonds, GG3, a bunch of different brands. 
Um, there are kind of two general types of skins that you'll find. You'll find ones made out of nylon. Nylon tends to have highly slight retraction and durability. So it's a little bit stickier, lasts a little bit longer. And mohair, which has a little bit better glide. So you slip a little bit more efficiently and they tend to be really lightweight. So yeah, again, thinking back to like, how do you plan to use this gear? What's important to you? The nylon tends to be slightly cheaper, the mohair a little bit more expensive. When you buy skins, it'll come, they'll come uncut. So in a big wide uh, sheath and you will trim them to fit your particular ski. And maybe it's worth backing up just a second. So skins have two sides. One side is hairy. It kind of feels like velvet. So it's soft one direction and rough the other direction. This allows you, this is the side that faces the snow. And when you're sliding along, you slide with the soft direction and then the hairs grab onto the snow and prevent you sliding backwards. The other side of the skin is uh, sticky. It kind of feels like flypaper and it sticks onto your ski. Um, and so the combination of that sticky glue plus a tail clip and a tip clip keep the skin attached to the bottom of your ski when you're moving uphill. When you buy your skins, you will need to trim it to your specific ski. There are a ton of videos online, different tools are made that can help you get it trimmed. Uh, shops will also trim skis for you. It is kind of a like high risk activity just in the sense of like if you make a big mistake, like you, you've made a big mistake on your one set of skins. Um, so do take some time and like make sure that you're ready to undertake the process <laughs> before you do it. Um, and in terms of storing your skis or storing your skins, make sure to store them nice and dry, take care of them. Uh, when I'm ski touring, I actually just tour with my skins stuck together. So the glue stuck to the glue side. Some people will use this little skin saver, this little mesh mat that you get given with your skis, with your skins, that can be a good option. But make sure every time you take them home that you get them really nice and dry, um, that you don't store them just like balled up in a wet mess in your garage. So this video is gonna go through kind of a person transitioning their split board from split mode to downhill mode. So imagine you were out touring, you had gotten to the top of the hill and you're ready to go downhill. Just in case this is new to any of you, this kind of gives you a visual demonstration of what's going on because there are a lot of moving parts. Okay, awesome. Oh, no, we won the next slide. We've already watched the video. Great. And the, the last item of gear that you will have with you when you're ski touring is poles. Everybody takes poles um, when they're touring, split borders, and skiers, uh, primarily for the way up. You, there are a bunch of different design options. Um, if you're a skier, get the poles that you like to use. Uh, there are, you know, there can be benefit to collapsible poles. If you're doing a bunch of ski mountaineering, it can be nice to have that like shortening option. Um, a lot of people right now are into the, you know, fancy fulcrum Euro style poles that you see in the resort. Uh, they're nice just because when you're walking uphill, sometimes the hill's really steep, sometimes it's really low angle. So being able to grip at different parts on the pole, so having that extended grip area is really, really nice. Uh, if you're a split border, 
I do think that collapsible poles is nice because in certain terrain, when you get to the top, you're going to want to collapse your poles and attach them to your backpack so you can ride like you would in the resort without poles downhill. There is terrain where splitboarders will keep their poles out um, if there are sections that are kind of flat and they are going to struggle to keep their speed. Having those poles out to pull along for short, dur uh, short durations can be really nice. And finally, we've got backpacks. So what we're going to put all of our stuff in. You can use any backpack that you have for ski touring. It doesn't have to be designed for ski touring. So especially if you're just getting started out, you're kind of figuring out what you like, what you don't like. You can start with any uh, backpack that just make sure it has enough space to fit all of the gear in it that you need. As you get more into it, I do think that it is really nice to have a a pack that's designed specifically for touring for a couple different reasons. One, it's really nice to have a, uh, a snow tools pa uh, pocket. So in this picture of Dekine pack pack, you can see that there's a flap open on the front where the person has stored this, their shovel and probe. We'll talk more about shovels and probes in a little bit, but it's nice to have a separate pocket for those items. Additionally, it's nice to have a little goggle pouch like at the top of this Dekine backpack. Uh, Backpacks that are designed for ski touring or splitboarding will have features where it makes it easier to carry your splitboard or your skis on your back. If you were going up a steep slope and it was no longer possible to skin, you just were going to boot up it. You were just going to climb up it. You can get ski specific bags in all uh, like leader sizes, uh, depending on how you plan to use it. If you're just day touring, you can get away with a smaller backpack, something in the 25 to 35 liter range. If you plan to use this backpack for overnight trips, you can find ones that are, you know, ski backpacks that are up to 50 liters. That way you could take things like your sleeping bag and your tent with you, as well as all of your ski gear. Additionally, it's really nice to have a, uh, a backpack that actually fits you well for the downhill. I find that if you're not used to skiing or riding with a backpack, it really does change where your weight is and kind of change what the ride downhill feels like. So you can improve that situation by getting a pack that actually fits you well. And for me, that's specifically pack length. I'm a smaller woman, so having a women's specific backpack really helps the pack actually fit me and not get in the way of my downhill riding. So that can be nice to try these packs on if you are shopping for one um, or get fitted by a local gear shop. Some people might choose to get airbags. So a, a backpack that's designed specifically for travel in the backcountry that also includes an added safety function for avalanche uh, safety. If you're not familiar with airbags, the idea is, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about avalanche gear in just a bit, but the idea is they have a trigger on them, uh, the, a little pull tab that's connected to a canister of air. When that canister is, when the trigger is pulled, when the canister is released, it inflates a large balloon around your head, neck, and back, like this woman, the orange balloon, when she's traveling, is usually stored just tucked inside the backpack, totally deflated. It's only out because she pulled that trigger and inflated it. If she's caught in an avalanche, it helps make her more likely to not be buried. It doesn't reduce, um, it doesn't eliminate the chance of you know trauma it doesn't eliminate the chance of being buried it's not a substitute for proper agile avalanche education or carrying other avalanche gear but there is good research saying that um, avalanche airbags can significantly reduce morbidity and mortality associated with being caught in an avalanche uh, the downsides are one they're, they're pretty heavy it's definitely extra weight on your back and two they are expensive so if you spend a lot of time traveling in the back country, they can be a really nice added layer of safety to add to your travel system. But it's worth thinking about, you know, making sure that you have the training, the avalanche training and education that you need in addition to the airbag. Don't get the airbag instead of the avalanche training. And uh, spend some time, you know, maybe like if you have a big birthday coming up or somebody owes you a really, really nice present. Uh, look, for, look for a good sale on one. That can be a good way to kind of help defray the cost. There's two different types of avalanche airbags really out on the, on the market right now. There's ones that reply, rely on a canister. So there's a compressed air or nitrogen canister in the bag that actually gets punctured when you pull the trigger and then releases the air into that balloon. There's also ones that are electronic, so they're run by a fan. When you pull the trigger, it initiates a fan that pushes air into that airbag. Um, both work really well. The compressed, the canister ones, the compressed air and nitrogen ones can be difficult to fly with. If you plan on 
ski touring in different areas around the country and flying, um, you can't fly with that compressed air. So when you would get to a new location, you would need to find a place to fill your canister or purchase a new canister. The fan ones, on the other hand, do not require um, a canister, obviously. So they're much easier to travel with and you can plug them in, like they're, they have an electronic battery pack in them to run that fan. You can plug it in in your living room. So those are nice things to think about if you're choosing which airbag you want to get. Awesome, so let's dive into Avalanche specific gear since we already talked a little bit about airbags. When you're traveling in Avalanche terrain, um, you always, always, always need to travel with three essential pieces of gear. Those are gonna be your beacon, your shovel, and your probe. Everybody traveling in Avalanche terrain should be carrying this. Everybody in your group should have this. A beacon is basically a small computer that you wear on your body. It sends out a radio frequency and it lets you be located by other people that have a beacon. And it also lets you locate other people. So in this photo at the bottom of the slide, the beacon is the orange and red and black thing attached to a small lanyard that you would wear right next to your body. You would turn it on at the beginning of the day and you would only take it out if you, were, if you needed to conduct a search for somebody that had been involved in an avalanche. In addition to carrying a beacon, you should be carrying a shovel. These are designed to be avalanche specific. So uh, avalanche debris tends to be really firm and compact. So not using a plastic shovel that you found like at the bottom of the, your pile in the garage, um, but something that's actually designed for moving large amounts of heavy snow. These are designed to be pretty collapsible and lightweight. So they fit in your backpack pretty well. And finally, you need a probe. A probe is basically a long tent pole that has a lockout function. So unlike a tent pole, which just falls into pieces if you take it apart, um, this has a function on it that will actually lock. So that way you can use it. Once you've located the person in the snow with the beacon approximately where they are, you use the probe to actually locate where they certainly are before you start digging. Just carrying all of this gear with you um, is one thing and that's great. But if you don't know how to use it, if and when you need to use it, you won't be prepared. So it's critical that you practice these, how you use this gear and companion rescue skills at least once a year to stay fresh. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to practice that. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. So for now, we'll just talk about the fact that these are critical pieces of gear that everybody traveling in the backcountry should have with them. Weston created this backcountry packing list that I actually really like because at this point we've talked about so many different things, right? So if you have this pulled up on a computer or your phone, you can screenshot this. Additionally, you could go to the link listed down at the bottom, uh, westernbackcountry.com packing list. Um, and it gives you a really good kind of starting point because there's a lot of gear involved in what we just talked about. We talked about kind of the critical gear. So the actual way that you travel in the backcountry, the skins, et cetera, the backpack that you would need. In addition to all of that and the avalanche safety thing, you still need gear that will just support your happiness and health. So that's things like clothing, all of the layers that you might need. And when we think about clothing for traveling in the back country, it's gonna be slightly different than what you use in a resort. In addition to those warm layers that you use when you're heading mainly downhill and then sitting on cold chairlifts, you want some lighter weight layers that breathe really well because moving uphill, carrying all of this stuff with you know, split board or skis on your feet is hard work. So you are gonna sweat, you're gonna be working hard. You wanna have layers that you can go down to that are really good for moving. And then you want layers that you can add when you get to the top when it gets cold. You're gonna need things like water, food, sunscreen, and you wanna think about emergency items. So do you have a first aid kit? Do you have things to repair your gears, especially items for split boards? Ski straps are really nice. You'll see these kind of stretchy volet ski straps. Those can be used to repair, I swear, pretty much anything in your life that you might need to repair. So those are a really useful thing to carry with you in the back country. And you need to consider your navigation. So I primarily use my phone. I use apps on my phone as my, my navigation plan. And that's a great option. More and more people are taking it. If that is the option that you pursue, do be aware that phones are really, phone battery life is really affected by the cold. So make sure that you're really intentional with how you store that phone. I'll usually store it right next to my body so that way the battery doesn't die. And um, if you're worried about the battery dying, you can either carry a battery pack or you can familiarize yourself with how you use a map and compass just in case your phone failed. 
Some additional items that weren't on that list, but we think are pretty worth talking about. I already mentioned phone. Um, I swear by lip screen, so lip balm that has some SPF in it. It'll help save your lips from all of the like wind and, and chapping that happens. I really like hand warmers, especially when you're getting used to how your gear works. You might find yourself spending a lot of time at the top of the ski run with your gloves off, futzing about with your bindings, trying to get them to work. Um, and so having hand warmers to warm back up your fingers are really nice. Spare batteries are important, even if you don't travel with them in the backcountry, having them in your car because you want to make sure beacons run on batteries and you want to make sure that you have enough battery life in your beacon, in your headlamp, etc. A spark tool, that's something specifically that um, lets you use different bits um, to adjust certain types of screws. That's basically just saying make sure that you have the items that you need to repair your own binding, bindings, whether you're a skier or a splitboarder. A spare powder basket can be nice. So that's the powder basket is the part at the bottom of your ski pole. Um, for the most part, the ski poles that we use in the backcountry, we use ones with powder baskets because you're kind of pushing off of the pole when you're skinning uphill. So those really little baskets that you sometimes see on resort poles that are designed for like ski racing aren't as useful. Powder baskets, if they're not well attached, will fall off. Um, so then you have a pole that doesn't push back against the snow at all, which isn't very useful. It can be nice to have a spare one in your repair kit. Um, an inclinometer can be nice. That's specifically a tool that's used for um, determining whether a slope is steep enough to be considered avalanche terrain. That process goes a little bit beyond what we have time to talk about tonight, but if it interests you, I'll kind of refer you to other avalanche education resources. I am, I, I am a firm believer in carrying a thermos with me with hot tea or hot coffee in it. I find that when it's really cold out and I travel with a water bottle of cold water, I just don't drink any water because I don't want to drink cold water when I'm cold, but if I travel with a thermos and at the top of every, you know, lap that I'm taking, I get a nice little hot cup of tea, I'm a much happier person at the end of the day. Finally, for our female bodied participants, um, it can be nice to get used to using a pee funnel. If you've never used one of these before, they, there's a bunch of different brands out there that exist. They're in this photo, the like funnel looking thing that kind of looks like what you would use to put oil into your car. And the idea is that you can pee without having to expose your butt to the elements or to other people that might be out traveling in the back country. Um, you can pee from standing. It is a nice tool. Uh, I don't usually take one in the back country with me. I will just either shuffle away from the group or get comfortable with peeing in front of my group. Uh, the key there is that you face your fears. So if you face the group that you're traveling with while you're peeing, your butt is actually facing away from the group. There's, there's not that much to see. Um, and if you make aggressive eye contact with people, they'll, they'll generally look away. But a pee funnel can be nice if that's not your jam and it lets you keep your pants on, which when it's really cold and windy is nice. Awesome. So we talked a little bit about the gear that you might need. Now let's talk about how to actually get started. You've collected all the pieces that you need. You're ready to go out. What's the next step? First, I'd recommend taking an intro course. There's a lot that goes into creating a successful experience in the mountains, and it can be useful to have people that have experience doing that help coach you through what to do. Just from planning a tour, to executing it, to travel techniques, to how to actually make those steep kick turns that you see people making, uh, an intro course will cover a lot of that material. Alpine Ascent specifically offers two-day backcountry ski seminars in the Crystal Mountain backcountry and other areas, so like Snoqualmie Pass or Baker, whatever your preferred zone is. And one of those are going to be raffled off at the end of this evening, um, but I highly recommend something like that. I think it really eases the transition into getting into the backcountry. Some of the benefits include that the guides are really familiar with the area. They'll show you a good tour so you're not left kind of trying to like figure it out as you go. And they'll help you practice a bunch of tour planning, travel techniques, et cetera. Um, so that way when you head out on your own for the first time, it's not a brand new experience. It's something that you've done before. Additionally, you can basically test ride gear. Um, some great options for doing this are resort demo days where there are gear rentals from other areas. Uh, there's a lot of gear rental places in Seattle that actually do offer touring gear. So while you're figuring out what gear you want and how to make it work for you, you can rent some items and practice with them. An additional option that's really great for getting your big toe in traveling in the backcountry is use a ski resort and look up their uphill travel policy. All ski resorts will have 
some amount of uphill travel approved or not allowed at all. But in Washington, I think all ski resorts allow some amount of uphill travel. Each ski resort is going to have a different policy. And it's super important to preserve access to that uphill travel that we follow those policies. If ski resorts find that people just can't seem to follow the rules, it's not impossible that they'll shut down that access. So take the time, look at their website. Uh, if you go to the Northwest Avalanche Center, they have a, a like a clearinghouse, a, a a summary list of the policies at all ski resorts about their uphill travel. But if you just typed in, you know, ski resort, uphill travel policy, a page would probably come up on Google that'll give you all the information you need about where you can go, where you can't go, when, et cetera. Most ski resorts will have some waiver that you sign, potentially some fee, um, and they might have designated areas that you can and can't go. Since this is a crystal event, I'm going to talk specifically about the crystal uphill travel policy. Um, so hopefully that applies to most of you. Again, if you crystal is not the area that you plan to travel, or if you're like, you know, I'm, I live in Seattle, I'm a lot closer to Summit Central or Summit West, I'm going to do most of my uphill travel there. Again, go to their websites, it'll give you a lot of information. So there are three key points for the crystal uphill travel policy. Number one is there are no uphill travel lights. When those lights are turned on and flashing, the blinky lights, then no uphill travel is allowed anywhere in the ski area boundary. What that means is that active avalanche control work is going on. So the reason why they don't want people traveling uphill is they don't want you wandering into an area that was closed to public, but you might have had no way of knowing and end up beneath bombs that are going off. So those lights are located all over the bottom of the ski resort. There's some, you know, in the main um, main area right next to the chapel. There's some next to the ski patrol room. There's some next to the gondola. There's some next to the restrooms. There's some next to the bottom of Chinook chair. So if you see those flashy blinky lights, uh, then there is no uphill travel allowed in the ski resort. You can also usually go onto the website or call ski patrol and ask, but the best way to know in the moment is to look at those flashy lights. The second rule is that all uphill travelers have to carry an uphill travel card. These are free. You go to guest services and basically you sign a waiver saying that you know the rules. It is a way for the ski patrol to make sure that all the people that are traveling uphill actually know about the uphill travel light and where they can and can't go. And it also uh, manages some of the liability just associated with walking uphill while people might be headed downhill. And number three is all uphill travelers are responsible for following the approved uphill routes on any given day. And day to day, that's gonna change a little bit. The next slide that I have is gonna talk about some of those uphill travel routes. If you have questions about this, I have the link for the Crystal Mountain Uphill Travel Policies website where you can learn more, or again, you can type into just any Google Crystal Mountain Uphill Travel and it should take you to the right page. Cool, so we've got this map of Crystal and there are a bunch of lines drawn in in pink. These are all of the lines that Crystal considers uphill travel routes. So you can see there's a line up Quicksilver. There's a line from the top of Quicksilver up to the top of Forest Queen via Queen's Run. And then there's a couple different ways to access Little Shot right to the side of Lucky Shot that take you to the top of the mountain. On not all days will all of these routes be approved. Usually on midweek days, if there's no avalanche control work going on, there's these, all of these routes are usually approved. But on really high use days, on holidays, on busy weekends, they find that there's just too much chance of collision on a lot of these routes. So sometimes the only route that will be approved is going up Quicksilver to access this area. You can find this information on the website. You can also talk to guest services. You can talk to Ski Patrol. You can call Ski Patrol. And they'll let you know what routes are approved for uphill travel on that specific day. So. We've talked a little bit about you know, how you can demo gear. We've talked a little bit about how you can travel uphill in a ski resort. So that way you know that you're not traveling in areas where there might be big avalanche risks. But at some point, you're gonna wanna travel in the backcountry. And when we're traveling in the backcountry, we do have to think about avalanche risk because uh, an area like a ski resort actively does avalanche control work to reduce or minimize the risk. As soon as you head out into the backcountry, nobody's been throwing bombs, nobody's been out there doing avalanche control work. So you have to anticipate the fact that there could be avalanches and get training on how to help prevent yourself from being involved in an avalanche accident. There's a bunch of different ways to get avalanche education. 
The American Av Institute for Avalanche Research and Education is kind of the gold standard for avalanche education in the United States, particularly in the Northwest. And they offer a bunch of different courses to cover people's uh, entrance into the backcountry, entrance into traveling in avalanche terrain. In these courses, you learn things like how to prepare for backcountry travel, decision-making tools, ways to assess and manage risk, and then actual rescue techniques. So how do you use that beacon? How do you use the shovel and probe? The entry point for the ARI avalanche education track is to take an ARI level one course. Alternatively, you can take an avalanche rescue course. The avalanche rescue course is a one-day program. It focuses just on how you use your beacon shovel probe. The ARI level one course is more comprehensive. You talk about what avalanches are, how they happen, why they happen, where they happen, how you plan a trip around an avalanche forecast, which is issued um, you know, by, by avalanche forecasters to tell you where they think avalanches might happen on a given day. If you take these two, you spend time outdoors, you get more experience, and in a couple years you're like, wow, some of these things have kind of really come together in my mind, but I have questions about this and this, and I want to learn more about this, then it's time to take an ARI level two course. This is where you put a lot of the things together that you might have been learning in your personal travel since you took a level one, and you get more practice and feedback actually applying some of the decision-making tools uh, alongside an educator or professional. Alpine Ascents offers all of these courses, so you can go to the Alpine Ascents website. Um, they've got dates available throughout the season in all kinds of different locations, including Crystal Mountain, but also Snoqualmie Pass and Baker and Paradise if you really enjoy going to Mount Rainier. So there's a bunch of different options for that. In addition to actual avalanche education, it is worth thinking about first aid and rescue. So when you travel in the backcountry, ski patrol is not there to come and save you, right? Kim Haft and Darwin, the people in this photo, are not there to come save you right away if you need help. So thinking about being prepared to save yourself or being prepared to call for help if help is needed. So some, some thoughts is that like, one, you need a first aid kit. You should consider it an essential piece of your gear. And that first aid kit doesn't need to be huge. It's not like you have to carry the whole medicine cabinet with you, but it should give you the option to deal with some things that might come up. Number two is that um, it's highly recommended that you find a wilderness first aid class or a wilderness first responder class. So these are gonna be educations um, directed primarily at people who are spending time in the backcountry, not always in the snow. They're also designed for people who spend a lot of time hiking, who spend time in remote areas for work. And those will cover how you respond to health crises that might come up when you're traveling in the backcountry, when you have really limited resources. They're really fun. Um, you learn a lot on them. And they're going to be a great resource for you if you find yourself spending more and more time outside away from ski patrol can help you. Some things that you might want to consider carrying to help your first aid kit grow is um, a SAM splint. So that's a really easy to use multi-use kind of foam lightweight splint. You might want to carry some sort of uh, personal locator beacon. So this is not an avalanche beacon. A PLB is something that you can use to talk to the outside world with in an area that you don't have cell phone service. So this is something like a spot device, a Garmin inReach, a Delorme, et cetera. So something that either has the option for you to push like an SOS or panic button, or has the option for you to text with, a, with an emergency dispatcher that would help get resources to you in the event that, you know, you're skiing and somebody breaks their leg and can't walk out and you really need some search and rescue support. It can be useful to think about carrying a bivy or a rescue sled. So if you got stuck somewhere, you couldn't walk out right away, you needed to stay warm and dry for the night or while you're waiting for rescuers, or a rescue sled that would actually help you pull somebody out. And I mentioned before, ski straps are super useful. They'll fix almost anything in your life except for a broken leg. So they're useful to carry a lot of, they'll help you fix a lot of gear, and they'll help you be your own source of rescue a lot of the time. So we've talked a little bit about the training you might need. Now let's talk a little bit about how to actually go about planning and executing a trip. There's a lot that goes into thinking about planning a tour for the day. When I'm thinking about where I want to go, what I'm going to do on a day off that I have that I want to go ski touring, I'm thinking about the avalanche hazard. I'm thinking about my goals for the day, right? Do I want to get powder laps? Do I want to have a nice long walk in the mountains? Do I want to go see something specific? I'm thinking about the distance. How far do I want to go? 
I'm thinking about the difficulty of ascent. Is it really steep skinning that's going to be difficult? Am I looking for something easier? And I'm thinking about the difficulty of descent. So is it a steep couloir that I really need to focus on? You know, is the snow conditions right on that day? Or am I out skiing really low angle hippie powder where um, I'm, I'm not that worried about the descent? I'm thinking about weather. What's the weather like that day? How's that going to impact where I go? I'm thinking about daylight, especially this time of year. Days are really short. Do I have enough time during the day to actually get to where I want to go? And I'm thinking about navigation. How hard is it to find where I'm going? Have I been there before? Am I with people that have been there before? All of that goes into planning a tour. And it can sound like a lot. So one thing that I highly recommend is to build yourself a tour library. And what I mean by that is while you know you have some downtime potentially this week or the next week while we're dealing with a little bit of uh, rain that's going on in the mountains right now, spend that time at home where you might not be out skiing, collecting ideas of where you might want to go and start making some lists, you know, say like, I know that I really want to go ski touring in this area and list out some ideas of like, this would be great when avalanche hazard is low. And when I have a longer day in the springs, because it's going to be a long walk to get back there. And when I have a partner that I trust, because, you know, we're going to have to make decisions. And you can compare that with a tour in your tour library, which is like, this is a great one that I have in my back pocket because I can go there when avalanche hazard is higher because I'm not in avalanche terrain. And it's a short trip, so I can go there and get a couple laps maybe like after work and then drive home. And I can go there with somebody that I don't know super well because, you know, we're not really in risky terrain, so we're not having to make as important decisions. Having those options in your back pocket will help you apply them when the weather and forecast is right. So I highly encourage you over this summer, you know, over the coming year or just in your downtime, you know, spend some time looking at different guidebooks that are available and start constructing in your mind that tour library. We're going to give you a couple options or a couple examples of tours in the Crystal Backcountry. There are a bunch of these on FatMap. FatMap is a really great resource. It's an app that you can download to your phone um, and it lists out some or draws out some potential up track and down track ideas. Do take all of this with a grain of salt. You know, it's not curated by um, anyone really specifically. So just because somebody else has like drawn it in as a great option, it doesn't give you permission to turn off your brain when you're out there. You still have to be out there making good decisions, assessing the hazard for yourself, making sure that it's appropriate on that given day and for your given group. So one really great option in the Crystal Back Country is Triple F, when uphill travel is allowed. So to access Triple F, you go through the ski resort. So you travel directly up Quicksilver, right? So that's why when uphill travel is allowed only, you have to be able to go through the ski resort to access the ski tour. And then you'll see this green line just outside of the ski area. That is triple F. You essentially ski through some of the low angle glades. It can be really fun skiing. It's great because you're never in some of the steep ridge line. You are near it. So you do need to think about that critically, but you are not um, immediately on the steep ridge line. So it's a great spot to go um, if you're getting experience um, or if it's maybe a little bit stormier. One really important thing is that when you do get to the top of Quicksilver and you're leaving the ski resort, it is important to make sure that you don't accidentally go back into the resort towards South Back and Silver Basin. Uphill travel is not allowed in Silver Basin. There are a whole bunch of signs that will direct you, but basically once you get to the top of Quicksilver, if you always take the left-hand option, so if you're walking uphill, if you always take the left-hand trail, that'll keep you out of Silver Basin and out from accidentally going into that area that is closed. This is a great beginner tour. It features nice open bowls and gladed trees, like in this photo. It takes a couple hours to get up there, depending on your speed of walking, but it's definitely a shorter day, which can be really nice. And it's the highlights I consider it's a great introduction to touring. You're not too far from the resort. Um, you'll likely see other people out there. You're not having to go up any really steep terrain, so it's a great way to kind of figure out how your gear works. The second option that we wanted to highlight in the Crystal area is the East Peak Tour. You can find this tour in um, a number of guidebooks in the area. You can find all of these tours in a number of guidebooks for the area, or you can find it at this link on fatmap.com. We've drawn it into this map in red. So you leave the ski area and you head east up towards Bouillon Basin. You follow snowshoe trails, and eventually you break off of the snowshoe trails and head directly up East Peak. You usually have to make some switchbacks. There are some sections that are a little bit steeper. 
Um, and the summit of East Peak is this unlabeled point 6654. This is probably a beginner to intermediate tour. It does take a little bit more skill because you're traveling in steeper terrain. It's a longer day. You have to make some of those steep turns. It features open bowls and trees. A lot of East Peak was burned a couple of years ago. So you ski through all these kind of like cool old burned trees. There's Wait, Mary, can you confirm that you see that slide? Yes, can confirm. Wonderful. Okay, where were we? Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, Zoom, Zoom, the Zoom environment is always fun, as I'm sure many of you have experienced at some point in this uh, multi-year Zoom adventure that we've all been on with each other. But we'll dive right back in with talking about East Peak. So I mentioned a little bit about the generals of where East Peak is and how you get there. It is a little bit more advanced. It's a slightly longer tour. It takes about four to five hours, depending on how fast you go. And then, of course, once you're up there, you can access a bunch of different terrains. So how many runs you want to take, everything is going to, how fast you move is all going to add or take time away from the length of day. Some of the highlights are amazing views. Um, from the top of East Peak, you've got a great view of the entirety of Crystal. On clear days, you can see Mount Rainier, and then you can look east and see some really pretty mountains in the areas. Additionally, it's a great area for dogs. Um, if you travel uphill in the ski resort, I believe that dogs are not allowed, um, but again, you would have to go to the website. At very least, they're on the leash. If you travel uphill in outside of the ski resort, so in the East Peak area, it's a much better spot for dogs. Um, do keep in mind that, you know, sharp ski edges and dogs are no good. So make sure that if you're ski touring with your dog, that they're, they're not running right underneath your feet. You wouldn't want them to get all cut up. And the last tour we want to talk about is uh, Bouillon Basin or Bluebell Peak. Depending on who you talk to, you'll hear it called different things. So this map looks slightly different than the last one that we highlighted, um, but it actually is similar terrain to what we just covered. So there's the main crystal ski area. And you can head uphill on those snowshoe trails just outside of the ski resort to access Bouillon Basin. From Bouillon Basin, if you look to your south, you will see Bluebell Peak. There's a couple different main bowls that come off of this, all of which offer great in, uh, intermediate uh, skiing. The terrain it type is a big open bowl. It is steeper. Um, all of the area in East Peak and Bouillon can be considered avalanche terrain. So you do wanna have that awareness going into that area make sure that you're traveling with the right gear, the right training that you've read the forecast. It takes a similar amount of time to getting to East Peak, about three to four hours. And some of the highlights are that because this is a different aspect than East Peak, East Peak is faces west and south. Um, Bouillon faces north. So it can hold really nice dry cold snow even after it's been sunny for a couple of days. Whereas East Peak might start to get crusty and the snow quality might change. So those are two really nice options accessed from the same point, both outside of the ski resort. So you can access them anytime. Even when the blinky lights are flashing, you can always access East Peak and Bouillon Basin. But both do feature a little bit more avalanche terrain, a little bit steeper travel. So it is worth making sure that you are aware of the avalanche forecast for the day. Some resources uh, beyond those tour ideas. First of all, there's a bunch of books out there, both for learning about avalanches and for learning about just traveling in the back country. Some ones that we really like are a book called Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain by Bruce Tremper. It's a great uh, overview of avalanche science. Some of it can be a little bit technical, so it's really nice to pair with an avalanche class. So maybe you take an avalanche class and you also read Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain. Additionally, there's the Avalanche Handbook, which I believe is put out by the Mountaineers. Um, it's a very good tool. And you can look at Mountaineering the Freedom of the Hills, uh, which is a well-known resource. It's been around forever and ever, covers a number of different topics just in terms of being in the mountains. It can be a little bit dense. It can kind of feel like a textbook. So that's a better reference if you have a specific question about something as opposed to reading from start to finish. In addition to these general books, there are guidebooks that will give you ideas of tours that you could take yourself on. One that we really like is Backcountry Ski and Snowboard Routes in Washington uh, by Martin Bolkin. It has several routes that, we, uh, that are in the Crystal area, including that East Peak tour and several others in kind of the Crystal Lakes zone. 
One important thing to note is that that was written a number of years ago now. So it'll have uh, text about like the access and where you can travel up low in the ski resort and how you access different terrain. Some of it is no longer update just because up to date, just because the rules were different, you know, five or 10 years ago when it was published. So do make sure that you actually refer to the ski resort itself and their updated um, uphill travel policy if any of those routes take you into a ski resort area. In addition, um, the Beacon Guidebook series puts out a specific little flip book designed for the Crystal Backcountry. I think it's called Beacon Guidebooks Crystal uh, Backcountry. And if you Google that, you'll find it. You can uh, order it through their website. Sometimes they're available at ski shops. Like if you go to REI in Seattle, you might be able to find it. But if it's not there, if it's sold out, you can order it online. And it has a whole bunch of different ski ideas for the crystal area specifically. Online, you can use uh, resources like avalanche.org for learning about um, avalanches a little bit more. It's not as comprehensive as taking class, but it will give you some uh, starting points, some great videos, and define some terms that you might hear. You can use mapping resources like CalTOPO to get a sense of what terrain is actually out there. If you're kind of like, man, I, I have an, I, I've heard that people go ski touring at this place, but I really don't even know what that looks like. Mapping resources like CalTOPO are going to be a great way to start. You can usually use different filters to look at, you know, maybe a Forest Service style map that you're similar, that you're familiar with, um, or you can look at uh, like satellite overlays. The satellite overlays usually um, are not always in the winter, so that might not be snow covered, but it will give you a good idea of like how dense is the tree cover in the area? Are there big open swaths that might be more or less fun to ski or more or less hazardous depending on the day? You can use the local avalanche center and WAC. Um, Again, you know, it's, it's really hard to talk about travel in the backcountry without also talking about avalanches. And we've kind of been skirting around it for this whole presentation, because if I were also trying to cover avalanche awareness in the same session, this would be like a four hour long Zoom call, which nobody has the Zoom energy for. Um, but uh, resources like NWAC will give you information both about the, the conditions in the backcountry and also the avalanche hazard for any given day. And there's a bunch of blogs um, run, apologies for that bunch of blogs run by uh, people that spend a lot of time traveling in the backcountry, such as Turns All Year. Turns All Year, you know, the idea there is it's, it's a site for people who go skiing every month of the year. There's a number of people that have been doing it for like an outrageous amount of time. You'll talk to people that have been doing it for like 30 years and have never missed a month. But Turns All Year will include a trip reports page. So if you're curious about like how much snow is actually in Bouillon Basin right now, or like you know, I'm, I'm headed there this weekend. Has anybody been out there recently, what it's like? That's a great place to get some up-to-date information on what's actually going on out there. Finally, there's a bunch of phone maps um, that for the most part are mapping softwares like FatMap, Avenza, and Gaia that let you locate yourself on the mountain. So figure out where you are. They can function like a GPS. And they also let you do some trip planning. So they let you look at a map and maybe draw in where you plan to go and then reference that when you're out in the backcountry. So I talked a little bit before about creating your trip library. So we've given you a bunch of resources to do that. We talked about a couple of different trips that you might take in the Crystal Backcountry. We talked about a bunch of different resources for assembling your trip library. Now that you have your trip library and it's actually the day that you have off to go ski touring, you wanna to make sure that you match the tour to the conditions. And this is super important. This is a key part of staying safe when you're traveling in the backcountry. is it's great to have that dream line that you really wanna ski, but you have to make sure that when you go to ski it, the conditions are right for it. So one way that you can kind of safeguard yourself against making bad decisions is if you have a whole bunch of different trip options, but you're not set on a plan for the weekend, right? The first thing that you do is you look at the weather, you look at the avalanche hazard, and then based on those things, you choose a trip. You don't do it the other way where you've already in your mind chosen a trip and you're just gonna try and shoehorn it into the conditions that are out there. So make sure that the tour that you plan to go on actually lines up with the hazard that's out there in the mountains on any given day. Um, I was going to spend some time kind of showing you around the Northwest Avalanche Center website. I think I'm gonna cut that just based on time. I wanna be respectful of this, this presentation not going on forever. I wanna leave enough time for Q and A, but 
The Northwest Avalanche Center is your best friend. They are, if you're spending time traveling in the backcountry, their website is really well designed to give you a huge amount of information um, about what's actually happening in the backcountry. So everything from avalanche forecasts to mountain weather, specifically covering area you might be traveling in, to uh, conditions reports from other people. So people can actually submit observations of what they've seen. I would highly recommend spending some time on that website. And if you want to learn more but aren't quite ready to take a full, you know, weekend long avalanche class, NWAC offers a ton of what they call avalanche awareness classes. They're free. They run about an hour, an hour and a half with questions. They're on Zoom. And if you go to their website and you slick, select the education tab, it will have a running list of all of the ones that are offered. So I highly recommend if you have limited experience with traveling the backcountry, you're newer to avalanches, or even if you just haven't thought about it for a couple of years, maybe you're getting back into it and you want a refresher, that's a great way to get some up-to-date information. And the final thing I want to talk about before we kind of move towards the end of this presentation is an important part of traveling in the backcountry is your community. So who you travel with. And it can be hard when you're getting into the sport to really make connections, to really find that group of touring partners you're going to spend time there, out there with. There's a bunch of different ways to build community. You can join backcountry themed Facebook groups or other social media groups that are designed to connect people that might be traveling in the backcountry. You can take a course, and like an airy course, and meet other students that are, have similar interests or desires to traveling in the backcountry as you. And you can look into free avalanche education and other local groups. Um, you know, it was easier to meet people through those when we were actually in person. But uh, any sort of way that you might be able to build connection with people is a great way to find those partners when you're getting into traveling in the backcountry. And I always tell people that finding the right partners in for traveling the backcountry is in some ways harder than like finding your life partner that you're going to spend, you know, the rest of your life with, because so many different things need to line up to be good compatible travelers in, in avalanche terrain. You want to find somebody that has, you know, education. They have, they have backcountry education. Maybe they have backcountry experience, or even if they don't have those, that they're aware of the education they have and what they don't have. I think awareness is critical there. Um, it can be hard to travel with somebody that thinks that they know everything, but really knows very little, because they won't be able to make smart decisions when they're traveling in that terrain. You want to travel with somebody that likes to ski or ride similar things that you do. You want to travel with somebody that has similar goals for the day. It's important to think about risk. So how much risk are you willing to accept? And does your partner have a similar risk tolerance? Can you guys meet somewhere where you both are comfortable? Some of the worst days in the mountains are summarized by people having really different goals and really different risk tolerances. And a final important consideration is athleticism. It's a, it can be a really frustrating scenario where one partner moves a whole lot faster than the other and then they're both frustrated at each other for not being something else. So the next question is, are you guys ready to drop in? Um, what, what do you need to continue moving forward in your backcountry career? So we've put together some kind of next steps and you can take a screenshot of this or you can just jot down some notes. Uh, demo skis or split boards at a local dealer or resort, get a rental. So that way you can practice with some of that gear and figure out what you like and don't like before you buy it. You can take gear in a resort um, and make sure that you look at their uphill travel uh, policy. Or you can take an intro to backcountry course listed on the Alpine Ascents website. So that way you start to get experience with how that gear works and how you move in your uphill to downhill travel modes. I highly recommend looking into local avalanche awareness education, um, specifically put on by NWAC. to start building your avalanche um, awareness before you head into the backcountry. And you can consider taking a level one avalanche course. Look into finding some guidebooks, borrow them, buy them, find photos of them, um, and start building your, your gear setup. So start identifying what gear you need, what you can borrow, what you can rent. Build those partnerships. So spend time creating connection with people that you want to travel with in the backcountry. Maybe those people already exist in your life, but maybe you have to put some work into finding people that have similar goals and travel styles as you. Go outside. Spend time out in the backcountry is how you're going to learn more about being in the backcountry, right? So once you've got your gear, once you've gotten some training, the best way to get more experience is choose safe days to go out and, and learn and learn by doing. Make sure that you're doing this in terrain that's safer on days that you feel safe with people that you feel safe learning with, but definitely need to, this is a, an applied science. You need to actually go out and do it. 
You can consider taking a wilderness first aid or a wilderness first responder course. So that way you're prepared in case somebody gets injured in the back country. And you can consider taking your avalanche level two course if you've already taken your level one or after you've spent maybe a season or two touring about and learning more on your own. And with that, I wanna send you all to go forth and slay POW cautiously knowing that there is risk involved. And I would love to open up the floor for questions. Maybe Mary can help moderate some of those questions. Mary might not be there. So right now I see two questions in the question and answer. If other people have questions, feel free to drop them in. Ernie wanted to ask, is there a reason why radio channels haven't been set up at Crystal like they have at the summit area? That's a great question. Uh, the radio channel setup is actually relatively new and uh, it's not impossible to, it's not impossible that they'll be set up in the future, uh, but for now, it just hasn't been developed in the area. And if you do spend time traveling in the, uh, in the Alpental Valley area, it's worth knowing that there is a shared a community radio channel. So if you purchase a radio and that has the ability to like access that radio channel, you can actually uh, communicate with other groups that are in the area and potentially call for extra resources. So hopefully that helps Ernie. Okay, Robin, uh, next question, which comes first, an intro course or an area level one? Awesome. Um, I would recommend taking an intro course just because it's free um, and uh, only an hour long, kind of a bite-sized chunk that can fit pretty easily into your schedule. They're offered very regularly um, via Zoom. And then that way it kind of introduces a lot of the terms and ideas so they can start percolating in your brain. That way, when you take your airy level one, you kind of have a background for it. You've heard some of those phrases before. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't delay taking your level one. Um, I would just take an intro, you know, soon and then take an airy level one as soon as you reasonably can, if that makes sense. Nice. Would you say a radio is part of the suggested equipment for a tour? A radio is a, is a good thing to consider, especially if you're traveling a lot in the uh, Snoqualmie Pass area, which has access to that community radio channel. It can also be nice to, if you are skiing lines where you're going to be out of sight of your partner, right? So maybe like Kular where like it kind of bends in the middle, you can't actually see the end. It's nice to be able to talk on the radio and say like, hey, I'm down and out. I'm out of the way. It's your turn to drop in now. Um, it's not like mandatory avalanche travel gear in the same way that a uh, uh, beacon shovel probe is. But if you find that it helps um, make your, your travel in the backcountry more, more efficient, more comfortable, then it could be something that you consider. One more question. There was the mention that the no uphill travel does not apply to East Peak at Crystal. Can you talk more about that? And what other areas around Crystal that that does not apply to? So the no uphill travel um, flashy light does not apply to pretty much like Gold Hills and over. So you can always travel uphill to get to Gold Hills and get to Pick Handle Basin. You can always travel uphill to get to East Peak and then all of the subsequent peaks there. So that's Cement Basin, North Peak and Lakes Basin. Um, everything else kind of on the like circuit of the valley. So going uphill from the base area all the way around over towards Northway is under the influence of that no uphill travel flashy light policy. Uh, some more questions. Can you talk more about the triple F and where it loops in with the higher ridgeline areas in and around Silver Basin? Uh, yeah, let me go back in my slideshow a little bit so that way that map is visible. So triple F actually does not access the ridge lines. Uh, strictly speaking, like the the what we consider the run triple F is one of these low angled hills and gladed terrain beneath the ridge line. You can use that area to access the ridge line. You'll hear it called Joe's Shoulder. There's a number of lines up in that area. You might have seen Gun Barrel before or Bear Gap. Um, 
And from that area, all of that can be accessed. That area is steeper, it is avalanche terrain. So you do need to consider before you head up to the ridge line um, what type of avalanche hazard you're, you're dealing with. Nice. What else do we got? Um, what resources do you recommend to learn more about safe ski mountaineering specifically? Um, so yeah, there's ski mountaineering is a huge topic, right? Because in addition to just traveling on skis in the backcountry, you're also adding elements of mountaineering, which may or may not be new to you. So I recommend that before you get into ski mountaineering, you make sure you feel really comfortable with backcountry skiing and ideally also mountaineering without skis. There are courses offered designed specifically to kind of coach people into getting into ski mountaineering. Uh, Alpine Ascent specifically offers some ski climb and descend uh, guided tours of Mount Baker, which are a really great way to learn more. And there are other, other services in the area that offer similar trainings. Where, where can you train with beacons? Great question. Uh, so it depends on what your goal is for that training. Ski resorts like Crystal have beacon parks. So if you ride to the top of Chinook and then you head over like you're headed to the bottom of Forest Queen, but instead of taking that more direct route, you kind of go around the back of that tree island, uh, you'll find the, the beacon park. There are usually signs that will point you in that direction or lift ops or ski patrollers will know how to get there. There are a bunch of beacons that are pre-buried there underneath probable boards. So you can go to a box that's at the front of the area, you push a button, it turns on one of the beacons or more of the beacons if you want a more difficult drill, and you can practice using your beacon to locate the other one. The way that you turn the drill off is you pull out your probe and you actually strike that probe board or probe plate. Please don't practice with your shovel there. The patrollers have buried the beacons intentionally. They don't want people digging them up randomly, um, but that's a great way to just practice that skill. If you want to practice a more realistic scenario, you can always take a course or set one of those up for yourself. So something that I'll sometimes do with my friends is maybe at the end of the day, we still got a little bit of energy left, but we don't want to take another ski lap. Maybe the ski conditions are kind of crummy. Um, we'll actually bury one of our backpacks with a beacon in it, make sure the beacon's turned on, make sure you're not in avalanche terrain because if you're taking a beacon off a person, right, you wanna be really confident that you're very far from avalanche terrain. But you can bury a backpack and then you can practice using your beacon to locate that backpack, probe it, and then dig it out. Nice. And are all area level one classes equal? All area level one classes should be, um, should meet a standard because that's regulated by the American uh, Institute for Avalanche Research and Education. Uh, of course, there's, there's a little bit of individual variation based on who is actually teaching that course. You might find that some teaching styles uh, resound with you a little bit more than others, but all should, should meet a similar standard because they're regulated through the uh, ARI Institute. Nice. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Before we do the big giveaway, free slot. Like there's one in here about Alpine Ascents. Does Alpine Ascents do guided backcountry tours? Yes. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, please go to our website. They have dates listed. They can accommodate uh, additional requests as well. So if you don't see something that really makes sense for you on the website, you can get in touch with the office and see what they can do for you. Perfect. All right. Without further ado, the drawing for the free backcountry ski seminar at Crystal Mountains a weekend seminar worth $600. And it's a great way to take what you've learned in your area level one course or just before taking one, uh, way to apply the avalanche forecast to the terrain, learn some great skills from guides um, about uphill travel techniques, really perfect your kick turns, and get a chance to see all of these great tours that Robin's talked about in this webinar. And the winner is Rebecca Kaplan. And I'll follow up with Rebecca tomorrow about picking out her ski tour, or her, her dates for her backcountry ski seminar. All right. Well, I think that is all, unless you have any closing words, Robin. Um, we thank you all for joining us. 
and for dealing with our slight technical difficulties on Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, thank you everybody. And big thanks to Christy Pellin and Crystal Mountain for putting on the Mountain Safety Fest and for hosting this evening. Thanks, and we'll be following up uh, tomorrow with uh, all of these slides and more information for you all. Thanks and have a good night.